So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, June the 9th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 211. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So here today, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for watching, and uh, I'm taking a back seat to the bees, of course, because that's what the channel's about. Observation Hive right next to me. So I gave that the limelight and probably the biggest... Uh, piece of visual real estate on today's video. So if you're brand new, welcome. If you want to know what we're going to talk about, please look down in the video description below and you'll see all the topics and associated links if there are any. And uh, the questions that we're going to address today are coming from people that submitted them over the past week. So what's going on outside? Well, there's a lot going on outside, but first I'll start with the temperature, 58 degrees Fahrenheit, 14 Celsius. The winds are at 3.4 miles per hour and they're gusting up to seven, 79% relative humidity. So now the humidity is on the rise. That's good news because we need rain. It hasn't rained for over three weeks. Sprinkled a little bit, but it's not even registering on my rain scale, but uh, that's an increase of 23%. From the week before and over the past week uh, if you've watched the news media at all if you listen to your local weather reports there's fires and the fires are sending smoke our way did you see the opening sequence the opening sequences uh, include haze and uh, here even in the state of pennsylvania we're not getting the worst of it but uh, the smoke from the fires is spreading down across the northern united states and it impacts the bees that's one of the first things i thought about so I created a little um, questionnaire, a little poll that I put on my YouTube channel. And if you don't know already, the YouTube channel is Frederick Dunn, F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K, Dunn. So you can go there. And even when you go to that YouTube page, if there's a question that you have about one of the hundreds of videos that I've put out over the years, you can click on the little magnifying glass there and type in the topic that you're looking for. And you may find that your question has already been answered in the past. So thank you for visiting my main page. And if you do have a YouTube channel, you're also welcome to subscribe. Anyway, I put my uh, questionnaire out and I simply said that I'm looking for input from residents who are in the heavy smoke areas. And that means areas where you might have trouble seeing the horizon line, for example, it's so dense. And it creates a surreal light, like in the middle of the day when it should be sunny, even though there's no clouds in the sky, the smoke has created this haze which if you're a photographer as I am, and yesterday I was out taking portraits, I thought, wow, this is really cool. Actually, even though, you know, the weather has created a poor quality of air right now, in fact, they have quality alerts going out to let people know that they shouldn't be outside and some schools even closed. That's how bad it was. They want you to stay inside your house and turn your air conditioners on loop. So it just recirks the air inside the house and doesn't even bring it in from the outside. Thank goodness we're not that bad here, but I wanted to know those who are in the heavy smoke areas, what are you noticing going on with your bees? Because after all, when we take our smokers and we light them and we puff our hives ever so lightly before you go in, we're interrupting their alarm pheromone and we want to get them to quiet down. And to do that, that means that they're consuming honey. And if they're consuming honey, they're taking up residence. They're not gonna fly out and come after you. So that's what bees do to prepare for enduring a forest fire. Well, so here we go, we have a forest fire. What are the conditions, by the way? Um, right now, uh, let's see, 17 active wildfires burning in Alaska. There are 413 active wildfires burning in Canada. That says, as of today, June the 9th. And uh, the following U.S. states are most impacted by the Canadian wildfires. Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, my state, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, New York City. It was like a big haze there in New York City. So anyway, air quality is impacted, so maybe the bees are responding. So my questions were, um, for the survey, it says, uh, yes, my bees are impacted by heavy smoke from the wildfires, or no, my bees are not impacted or demonstrating any change of behavior based on the wildfires. Fires. But only 73 uh, people actually responded, so this is a very small sampling, and I did ask only that those would respond who reside in areas where the smoke is heavy. But 
This is interesting. 59% of those who responded said the bees were actually reducing activity or no landing board activity while the smoke is hanging heavy over their apiary. That's pretty significant this time of year considering that we're in a heavy nectar flow and the nectar flow is critical for their winter stores. Now, as you can see, my bees here were not impacted. I could see it, it was hazy. In fact, it was so hazy here, I thought I was gonna go over and talk to my neighbor and say, why are you burning? We haven't had you know, rain in three weeks. Why would you, what are you burning? But then I looked in the other direction and even the horizon line was skewed and looked to the west and uh, the trees were disappearing into the smoke. So it was intense enough that it seemed like somebody really next to us is burning wood somewhere because that's also what it smelled like. So those particulates are getting around. But 41% um, said there was no uh, discernible change for their bees. But if 59% of beekeepers in the area, if that, you know, obviously the more people that responded, the more information we would have. And if you would like to respond, you can go to my YouTube channel. It's still there. And you can just uh, respond to that survey and let me know if you're in a heavy smoke area, are you noticing that your bees are not flying as normal? So they are acting like somebody's out there smoking your hives. That's a big impact. Now somebody else wrote me and I can't validate it. Someone else wrote and said that they were in a heavy smoke area and that uh, even things like hornets and wasps were dying. Now I don't know if that can really happen. Um, you know, it's, if it's something you're observing directly, if it's a personal observation, there's not a lot I can say, you know, against that, but you might be looking for other reasons why your wasps and hornets in your area might be dying. I don't think it's from the smoke. And the reason that I say that is the oxygen levels aren't reduced enough to really damage those insects. So I don't think the honeybees also, I don't think they're dying from the smoke. Uh, people, if it was that intense, that your insects are dying, I think you'd be in jeopardy when you're outside as well because more people die from smoke inhalation than the actual fires. So it's no small thing. Uh, other nations, firefighters are headed to Canada to help deal with the issues there. And uh, that uh, I'm told that Sunday, it will be even worse. So if you're still observing those things, please respond, please respond to that survey. I think it's just uh, an interest point. So that was pretty interesting. And if you're in any of these states, there's a lot going on right now. So as I said before, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. If you're not yet a beekeeper, it's interesting to me how many people are watching my channel and watch these Q and A's even who don't keep bees yet. So I think if you've been listening for a few years, you might be ready. If your area allows you to keep bees, I think you might be ready to start your own colonies now. So we'll get right into it. The first question comes from Carol. It says, hey, Fred, if we let drones with mites hatch, aren't we allowing the diseases or the diseased mites, it says diseases mites, carry to spread? Okay, oh yeah, the diseases that mites carry. Are we letting the drones out and then letting those diseases spread? And this comes from uh, the fact that this year, I'm counting varroa destructor mites on drones. And uh, more than that, we're putting the drone frames into queen cages uh, without the queen in them. So once your drone frame is capped and uh, we put it in that queen cage, that also prevents the drones from getting away. Normally, the way that was done is you would pull your green frame of drone comb out once it's capped. There's no reason to wait. Once it's capped, if there are varroa destructor mites in there reproducing, you got them, pull it. And then you can go and you freeze it or whatever it is you do, and then you open it back up, feed it to your chickens, whatever you do, and that's a way of controlling varroa destructor mites. Now the cool thing was uh, with my interview with Zachary, Dr. Zachary Lamas, uh, was that he discovered that uh, the drones, after they emerge from their cells, uh, are attractive to varroa destructor mites, more so even than the nurse bees that are in your hive. So the thinking is that those two to three day old drones would then attract the mites, the mites would get on their bodies, and then the drones couldn't get away because they're still in that cage, and now we've attracted mites. So not only do we now have the mites that were in the pupa state, 
and reproducing, but we also have any other mites that might have been in their dispersal phase that would now be attracted to these young drones, get on their bodies, and then we pull the cage out and we go and deal with them. So Carol's concern is if we let those drones go and they've been mite infested, aren't those drones then spreading as vectors of the diseases that the varroa destructor mites carry? And that's potentially true, but I have a fix for that. Here's my thinking, and I did already respond to Carol, but here's the thing. Uh, mites that are heavily infected, one of the worst things that you can get from a varroa destructor mite when it comes to bees, and you can see it physically, would be deformed wing virus. So shriveled wings, deformed wings, uh, those drones can't fly anyway, so they're a non-entity. It doesn't matter because they're not going to fly and mate with queens. The other thing we don't have to worry about is drones don't feed nurse bees and other workers inside the hive. Drones are consumers, not providers. So that's out of the picture too. And the other thinking is, uh, and what I said to Carol was, well, if they fly out and they're already infected with some diseases, then let's assume that they have a sublethal effect on their overall health and well-being, which means top performing drones, drones that can fly faster, that are healthier, would of course be the first to get to those virgin queens that are out at the drone congregation area available for mating. So I think they're out competed then. So the other side of that is, well, if you let those drones go, they could also go to other colonies of bees and get fed because they leapfrog to other beehives. And that's why they could really actually spread out quite a bit. But I have an answer for that too. What do you think? I think that when you use the drones uh, and you take that cage out, and if you do a non-lethal method of counting, so just as with the nurse bees, you can do a sugar shake on the drones. You can also do a CO2 to knock them out and then they could be revived later. But if I find that they're heavily loaded with varroa destructor mites, why would I revive them? So along with Carol's thinking, uh, the assumption would be made that they're also already infected and they have become vectors of whatever diseases the varroa destructor mites were carrying and therefore Time for the freezer or time to dunk them in soapy water or whatever your method is. For me, it would be the freezer or extended time in CO2. If you CO2 them too long, they don't recover. So you can do that too, but CO2 of course costs money. And I use the tire inflator CO2 cartridges to get them in packs of 10. So they're not that expensive, but you're spending about 50 cents every time you knock them out. And so that's for a whole frame. So the thing is, then you would, if you see a huge uh, load of road destructor mites, eliminate those drones too. And that also helps reduce the vectoring of diseases. Some other people have asked about this process and said, aren't we taking all the reproductive drones out of circulation and don't we need them? So that's again where I say, if you only got a couple of mites off of them, or maybe by some miracle, no mites on those drones, let them go. There's no reason to keep them, no reason to kill them. And they go right back out and they get fed by the nurse bees and they're back in play, so to speak. So you have the judgment call and remember that's new. So by the way, if any of you are already using those cages and if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can get those cages from Better Bee. They're called, uh, they're queen isolation cages. Um, and so they're intended to isolate a queen to create a brood break, but now, we don't need to create the brood break if it proves out, and I think it may, that the varroa destructor mites migrate to the drones, then we can leave the queen in lay full production and we're drawing mites away from the worker brood and from the worker nurse bees and only to the males. And that's our indicator for mite loads and also our treatment center now. There are some trade-offs. When you get that cage, and it's the kind that the whole frame goes inside, it's got a cover on it. I did a video about it, and I'll probably link that down below if you want to see it. But you could also find it just by searching on my YouTube channel. But um, you want to get that cage, and uh, you could use it for a lot of different things, but that's the number one thing for me, and I think it's going to be very effective. So we're gonna move on now to question number two with David from Jefferson, New York. Question is in regards to bee stings. 
I'm from upstate New York in northern Catskills. I'm kind of new in beekeeping and have lots to learn and relearn and really appreciate you doing your show, teaching, and what you do. Thank you. So thank you right back, and I appreciate those of you who are even watching right now. And if you go that extra step and make comments, I really appreciate that too. The first time I had bees and got stings, no problem at all. The next year, after I got a few stings on my arm, no problem. But later, I had a delayed reaction, many hours later, and my arm swelled up. Now it has been about five years since I'd been around bees, and I got my first sting on top of my right hand, and it was a very short and quick prick that got her off, and it did not hurt, and thought she didn't even get any venom in me. I finished putting the hive back together, and a short time later, my right hand started to swell up for the next few hours. It got very swollen. It took a day and a half to go back to normal. I also got a sting and at the same time on my left hand and the sting sack was in my hand and I scraped it off. Ha, no reaction at all from that sting. So my question is, is this normal and what is going on? Should I be concerned to have this kind of reaction from a sting or is this normal for a beekeeper? Or does it take time for the body to get used to getting stings and have no reaction? Thanks again. Okay, so here's the thing. First of all, what's normal when you get stung by the bee? Uh, David did the right things. Of course, as soon as you get stung, you scrape the stinger off, usually just with your fingernail, your hive tool is handy if it's right there. Scrape sideways, get that stinger out, and get that venom sack off with it. Okay. Uh, because if you don't, it will continue to contract. You can look at it and you can watch not only the little muscles there that are autonomous, which means they function by themselves away from the body of the bee, they continue to contract and continue to inject the venom in under your skin. And while that's happening, the little stinger is also pulling itself with, again, uh, autonomous muscles that just pull it right into. So it's in two parts and it's like pulling itself in and gets deeper so it delivers the venom deeper. So the quicker you get it off, the less the dose. Uh, and then how long should that swell? So 24 hours is pretty normal. Local swelling is pretty normal. Now, I'm not a medical professional, right? I used to be an EMT, but I'm not anymore. Um, but the real issue is if the swelling starts to show up in areas beyond the bee sting. So are you showing other vital sign responses? In other words, is your respiration rate cranking up? Is your blood pressure cranking up? By the way, those are also normal responses to a bee sting. If you were to put, as soon as you got stung by a bee, if you had, and most people don't, but if you want to try this at home and you get stung by bees all the time anyway and you think you're getting no response, check your vitals, check your respiration rate, and check your blood pressure. So if you have access to equipment that can do that, go into the right aid and sting yourself in the parking lot and walk in and stick your arm in the blood pressure thing. I'm just kidding about that part, but it did cross my mind. And... Uh, so you can also see what your oxygenation is and everything else. But anyway, your vitals do change. Even though you might not even see swelling, you would see vital changes and blood pressure is one of those that would increase. And that should be momentary. It shouldn't be for an extended period of time. So again, 24 hours or less, pretty normal. After that 24 hours, you're going to get some itching. So that's the other thing. Uh, and it should go away and it should be localized swelling. So if you get stung on the hand and your face swells up, Go to medical. You're a load and go. Time to go. You start to have respiratory distress. Time to go. You're having an allergic response that is above the norm. Uh, so the question is to, should you be stung a lot? And if you are, does your body start to reduce its response to stinging? I think it does. On the flip side of that, and this is that's why there's no across the board uh, way that that works, and that's because some people over time, being continually exposed to the proteins that are in the venom of the honeybee, uh, will develop a sensitivity so they can go the other way. Instead of getting a much reduced response physically and visually, um, then what they do is they start to get an enhanced response. And that's what happened to my grandfather up in Vermont. My grandmother was a beekeeper and my grandfather was stung so often that eventually he was the reason she had to stop keeping bees. And that's because uh, instead of becoming more and more tolerant, as my grandmother did, 
Uh, my grandfather became more and more sensitive and the physician told them that if you continue to keep bees, one of these stings, one of these days could actually kill you. So that was the end of her beekeeping. So you can uh, have issues, but 24 hours, local swelling, those things are perfectly normal, itching and things like that. Hot, it should feel firmer because your skin is tighter, of course, and fluids are building up there. So what can you do to reduce that? There's something called Sting Kill. That's the best over-the-counter uh, medication for bee stings, mosquito bites, and uh, wasp stings and things like that. It also helps quite a bit with the itching that can follow. So that's it for that. Question number three comes from Mike from Croton on the Hudson in New York. I've heard you mention and I've read about swarms returning to previously used bivouac locations due to the leftover queen pheromone. But in an area where there has never been a swarm, how is the first bivouac location chosen? Let's see, is it wherever the queen decides to land first? Is there scouting activity that happens first? Thanks for your time. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, if you never had a bivouac location, like bees are brand new to your area, they tend to do this within 150 feet of the hive. So what is a bivouac anyway? So when your bees are gonna swarm, and scouts have already been out for weeks, by the way. So scouts are checking into final spaces that the colony can reside in after they leave your hive, like this right here. They swarmed out, they don't go straight to the cavity that they're looking for. They go somewhere else and they hang on a branch or they hang on a fence rail or they hang on somebody's lamppost or under somebody's soffit or on somebody's gutter. You get the message and they do this generally within 125 to 150 feet of where the parent colony is. Now, if you've got a clipped queen or the queen did not have enough time to build up for that, sometimes they fly a much shorter distance and you can even find them on the ground with the cluster. And most of the bees kind of leave. They don't do very well at sticking together when there's just a queen on the ground. So that's another thing entirely. But uh, how do they find the location? I think they're just flying to, it's not a designated spot that they've scouted and found. They're pheromone based. And the queen is also following the pheromone of her own colony, right? So when they fly out, because that was part of the question, do they follow the queen? No, the queen follows the cluster, but then where she lands, they reroute to wherever she lands. So often you've seen, uh, probably, bees gathering on a tree branch and they're not settled. So you see a cluster and you can hear them and we have that great swarm dynamic, the sound, they're swirling in every direction and uh, they start to light on a branch or whatever the support structure is. And then as they start to collect, you see that they're unsettled. They're kind of moving in every direction, although more bees and more bees are joining them. And some of them are, of course, fanning their Nasanoff's gland and they're getting other bees to join them. But if the queen, for some reason, lands on a different branch or the queen lands on the ground or on something else entirely, they'll continue to be unsettled and they'll be searching all over as their mask builds. And then they'll reroute because now you'll see a handful of them collecting wherever the queen landed on another spot. And I've successfully rerouted the queen and some of the workers, of course, to another branch by using queen mandibular pheromone, the temp queen synthetic queen pheromone. Doesn't always work, but it works enough that it's fun to use and it's effective at getting your swarms to collect in an area that's reachable by the beekeeper, because that's what we want. We want to be able to see them, we want to collect them. But uh, so as far as, you know, what keys them in on that, you can help, but again, if you've never had bees in the area before, you can actually melt beeswax and propolis together, and you can go out and paint that onto a, pre -branch, a tree branch or another surface that you prefer the bees to go to. Bees like trees uh, to hang on temporarily. In fact, probably the most frequent site that we find bees on, other than, you know, we find them on fence posts and things like that, but tree branches are number one. No specific variety because we get them on the maple trees and we get them on the spruce trees pretty equal. Now, the thing that's referenced here is once they've collected on that branch and they're spreading their pheromone, and of course, this pheromone is through physical contact. So bees lick one another, they, it's body to body contact, and they're keeping that pheromone um, active throughout the colony. 
And when they find the queen, they're constantly, this is why they're constantly licking the queen and they're constantly in physical contact with her. And that's so that they can then touch one another and spread that pheromone throughout that cluster. So when you see a cluster of bees, once they have arrived on a tree branch and this searching around that they do all over the surface begins to stop, they align with one another, and then that cluster begins to tighten up, then you're 99% sure your queen is in there. If they start to get active again, or if you manage to catch the queen, sometimes the queen, the queen crowd surfs. She'll come out through a little hole, scoot across the surface of the bivouac location cluster, and then she'll go back in. If you happen to be there when she does that, and you can grab her off of there and put her in a queen cage, and I hope everybody carries one of those with them as a beekeeper, you never know. And uh, you'll see them almost immediately notice that she's missing and they'll start searching all over for her. And so then you can, of course, restore her or then you collect that uh, swarm and put them in a hive. And once you control the queen, you control the swarm. If they lose the queen, if you took her out, put her in a cage, put her in your pocket and you walk away and they get all active and they're searching all over for her, what happens if they can't find her? They go back to the original colony. But then you've done nothing to relieve the congestion inside that colony when it comes to the population of the bees in there. So uh, as far as you know, how they find it, I think they're just going for any you know, sufficient structure. In the absence of pheromone guides, uh, then they're just looking for any structure that can support them. It's rare that you see like a five pound swarm on a little skinny branch. So thicker branches are better. And uh, sometimes they go very high. I don't know what the advantage is to the bees other than they're out of predator range. So um, it's always kind of a perfect world when the bees fly out and land on a branch. It's only five feet off the ground. So, but uh, you can reinforce that if you've never had swarms before and you don't know of any swarm trees or bivouac locations where bees frequent, because it is what happens. You go out like clockwork, between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., if you're looking for brand new swarms, the bulk of the swarms happen between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. I don't know why that is. They also happen immediately following a rain event or a storm event if you're still in swarm season. And we are here in Pennsylvania, still in swarm season. We get two pretty strong swarm seasons. September, once again, becomes a big swarm opportunity for collectors. So, Painting pheromones from beehives and things like that onto tree branches can help them select that spot for their bivouac. And remember, a bivouac, they might be there for an hour, they might be there for a day. Lots of beekeepers this time of year have their names in with fire departments and emergency responders, and they say, if people find bees, I'll be glad to go get them. You should always be asking those guys, first of all, send me a picture of them, because you want to make sure they're honeybees. Second, how long have they been there? And you need to think about what time of day it is. If it's six o'clock at night and they're still there and they've been there all day kind of thing, very good chance you're gonna get them. But if you have to drive 30 or 40 minutes to go get them and it's two o'clock in the afternoon or one in the afternoon and they've been there since yesterday, they could be scooting. And one of the things, if you can kind of talk them through it, if you can get somebody on the phone that's not too scared to walk up to that uh, cluster of bees that's in their bivouac location. This is kind of a, a good way to figure out, is this gonna be worth the drive? First of all, you get them to take a picture and watch out for these people that take their pictures close up. You know, they make it look like a giant swarm of bees and then you get over there and it's smaller than your fist, but the way they took the picture and it was a blurry picture so you couldn't see that it was composed of 37 bees then uh, you kind of wasted a trip. You probably have an unmated queen in there. But here's the thing. Uh, if you can get them to look at that, get them interested, you might be winning over a future beekeeper here. You already know they care or they wouldn't have called it in instead of just killing them. So you can ask, are they settled? Does it look like they're like motionless? Like first thing in the morning, early in the morning, they'll be cold and they'll be motionless. What you're watching for are surface bees that might be doing little waggle dances one or two of them that's okay but if they're looking at it and they go yeah they're kind of wiggling all over the surface they're don't even bother because unless they're you know right across the street or something but if you're going to spend the time and gas money to get all the way down there to get those bees and there's a lot of waggle dancers on the surface they found a place they're trying to go somewhere 
especially when they're all doing the same dance, they're going to leave within the next 15 minutes. Just, I'm just giving you, you know, ways to vet it out. Is it worth the trip? Are you going to get them? And have your swarm kit ready to go. Your bee suit, your sugar syrup, all the stuff that you're going to need if you've got some kind of bee vacuum. If it has a battery, keep your batteries charged, all that good stuff. Be ready to go. Because uh, it happened to a good friend of mine where he got all suited up, got ready, and he's going to use his Colorado bee vac. He's getting all set. This happened to me this year too. You just plug it in and off they go. So all that setup time was for nothing. So having your go kit, being able to move quickly, don't wait a day. If it's, get out there and get them. If you've got a bee vacuum or something like that, late in the day, go get them. Don't, don't play games. Don't, don't lose them. Their chances of survival are very low. Okay, so that's the end of question number three. Question number four. Okay, this comes from uh, Mr. James from Birmingham, UK. Can you tell me, do you get better success by having your frames horizontal to the entrance or vertical to the entrance? Okay, I think perpendicular or parallel. So when you have your entrance, uh, like let's take this observation hive, for example, when you look at how the bees use a space, this is kind of a flat space. You know, it's wide and its depth is pretty shallow front to back. So this accommodates three frames. Now when the bees build their comb in spaces like this, they tend to build matching the long axis of the space. Now if it's inside a tree or something, this is why you get comb that kind of curls and wraps around it. And then what you want to see, and this is really interesting, Dirt Rooster and Mr. Ed, who see lots of ripouts, more than a thousand, how is the comb arranged compared to the entrance? Well, the entrances tend to come into the flat surface where boards come together. They're kind of normal, naturally occurring entrances and trees. It's an old rotted knot of the tree or something like that where a branch broke off. Uh, and here we have the entrance going through that wall over there and it comes in at an up angle and it's coming in parallel to the frames. So when you're looking at a standard Langstroth hive, there the entrance is coming in parallel to the alignment of the frames because the Langstroth hive is the deepest front to back rather than side to side. So it doesn't matter. The question is, does it matter to the bees? It really doesn't because the entrance location, height-wise, is more important to the bees than whether or not uh, they're going to make their comb flat to it or parallel to that entrance. So I guess the best way to find out uh, what the bees would prefer, if they're really picking how that's oriented to the entrance for airflow and all of that stuff, is we would have a cylindrical shaped colony and the bees would free build the comb. In other words, no framing, no starter strips, no uh, top bar hive configurations and things like that. Just a surface upon which the comb can be built and then you would see how they align that in a perfect cylinder with the entrance. And I don't have a lot of references for that. Um, I will say that my long Langstroth hives, they also come in parallel with the frames. So some people have long or horizontal hives and they put their entrance on the very end. When you're doing that, they're coming in and they're hitting a perpendicular uh, angle with the first frame with the first comb. So I guess they would be aware if that did something better or less. But I think the bees use the space and I think uh, there's not going to be a big difference in how they get into the hive. But I think the arrangement of the frames inside the hive overall and how they use that space is more critical than the entrance itself as far as its orientation to the comb that they have. So it's a very interesting question, and if somebody else has an answer, or if there's a video out there, or a study that's been done, please comment uh, below this video and link the study. Now, whenever you put any kind of link, whether it's to a YouTube video or something you want other people to look at, it goes into auto hold. In other words, your comment didn't go away. It just sits in limbo until I show up, look it over, and see if the link is viable, if it's something that's useful to people. And if it is, it gets released right away. Nine out of 10 of the links that are going to other YouTubes and things like that 
do get released, and especially if it reinforces something that we're going to talk about today. So that's an interesting question. I don't think uh, it changes a lot, one way or the other. Question number five comes from Nanette in Anderson, South Carolina. I have a question on combining hives with the paper method. How long should I leave the two boxes with the paper between them? I've heard 24 to 48 hours. I'm a little worried about the ones in the top not being able to get out since it's in the high 80s here this week. I do have an insulated top over them, and so there you go. Okay, first of all, I will link a video down in the video description to question number five that will show you this paper method for combining highs. And what I did that, uh, why I did that, was because I had a colony that was queenless. So I took the queenless colony, they're doomed. It was late in the year, they weren't going to make it. And I put newsprint in there. Oh look, I just happened to have this handy. This is newsprint. It is the exact same paper that newspapers are printed on. What's the difference? There's no ink on it. You can buy this very affordably from Amazon. So I have a box. I don't think I'm ever going to run out of it. I bought a big box of it. I let my grandkids color on it. I put it down if I'm working on uh, hive equipment and stuff like that. And I don't want to mess up a countertop. Things like that. So newsprint has a lot of applications. And that piece of newsprint is what you put on the resident colony that is queen right. So you've got a brood box and the bees are fully functional. Everything's going great. You've got a queen, but over here you've got a queenless colony. And now I take them in the same apiary. I don't do any fancy footwork when it comes to moving them around or taking them away and bringing them back and all that. They don't have a lot of time. They're losing bees every single day. At peak production, colonies are losing around 500 foragers in a single day, just through attrition, just through predation. Maybe there's one of those jumping spiders out there. But uh, they're flying out and they're just wearing themselves out and some are just not coming back. But you're losing a lot of bees every day. Without a queen, without replacements coming in, uh, you're gonna lose your colony. So by putting that paper in there, and I just take my hive tool and I make a couple of tiny slits. If you've got a pocket knife or something, make a couple of tiny slits. The other thing you can do to make this whole unification of two colonies easier, and it's very easy. I've never seen a huge fight happen when I did this. Uh, you put your newsprint on, you put the box right on top of them. So I ended up with a double deep. I can spritz it with sugar syrup, and you can do that in the corners if you want to. And that makes it a little soggy, but it also encourages the bees down below to start chewing it. So we want a gradual introduction and they actually do it very fast. In fact, I've seen the colonies combine super fast, like by the next morning, everything was normal. Now, the other part of this question is a little worried about the ones on top. So how long should I leave the two boxes with the paper between them? Let's be honest, I've never removed the paper myself. So I do go around the outside. A sheet like this is bigger than your 10 frame Langstroth hive. You got something like that. Look at the size of it. You can lay that over the whole hive. There's no measuring necessary. I go around the outside and just cut away the excess. And I just leave it in there. And the bees chew right through it. They tear it up and they pull it right out the front. I don't go back in and, you know, remove the remnants. In fact, uh, other than between the boxes themselves, there was no evidence that uh, that newsprint paper was ever there and they do that really fast and they ended up being one of my best colonies ever by the way nothing to do with the newsprint combination method but it is a very easy way uh, and it's something that's going to be in my uh, plan of the week at the end which is talking about making sure that your colonies are queen right but uh, the 24 to 48 hours and removing the paper eh, wouldn't do it I mean they're gonna they're gonna chew right through that paper they only need one little hole in the paper anywhere in it and the entire grouping from up above can go down. In fact, what they did in that combining, all of the bees in the upper box, even though they had frames and resources with them, they all went to the lower box. So it was a very interesting combining. Question number six comes from Carol 
And it says here that I think you said workers could not tell the difference between fertilized or unfertilized eggs. If the queen lays the egg, she must know then what size egg to put in what size cell. Well, stop right there. All eggs are the same size. Once they're, if they're coming from the same queen, she doesn't lay larger or smaller eggs. Egg size can vary queen to queen, but it's based on nutrition and so on. And it goes on to say, if you have a laying worker laying only drones, would some eggs be in drone cells and some in worker cells and some in queen cells? Also, I think you said, science has not yet seen a worker move an egg. How then, when you give a queenless colony eggs, do they get to a queen cell? Do they just build a cell around a fresh egg? Okay, so there's lots of stuff going on here. First of all, it also says, then there's a question, how are the nurse bees knowing which eggs to eat if they don't know fertilized from unfertilized? This boggles my mind. I hope you can go into this. Oh yes, I will, Carol. So here's what happens. First of all, um, there's something called policing. So when nurse bees are tooling around in the brood area and they're looking at the eggs that the queen has produced, so we'll start with the queen, um, they do scent the egg. They do kind of know what's going on there. And what they're looking for really is genetically close eggs. So in other words, any evidence of inbreeding, like of a queen for some reason ended up mating with a drone that was extremely closely related or even worse, her own drone, and she ended up mating with them, uh, then they police those up because that's genetically inferior. They're looking for diversity. So policing involves eating the egg. Now, they really get a strong pheromone scent from the larvae when it hatches from the egg, and that's at the third day. So at the end of the third day, the egg hatches, and then they get all their information about, is it haploid, is it diploid, right? So is that going to be a drone? Is that going to be a worker? And uh, diploid is going to be a worker and haploid is going to be the drone. So then that affects uh, what they feed, how often they feed and how long they feed. Okay. So the other part of this is, does the queen know if she's laying a worker or does she know if she's laying a drone? And she does. And so when a queen is productive and she's laying, she's measuring the cells that she's laying in. So when she goes and she's laying an egg, and this only matters really when we're talking about a worker or a drone, not whether the worker is going to be a queen. So the worker to the drone, when she lays a egg in a large cell, is going to be the haploid egg, it's going to be the drone. So then when that emerges, when that hatches from its egg, then the nurse bees know exactly what to do and it's gonna occupy that cell for 24 days. So then uh, the other part of this is that released pheromone, they know that also triggers them to feed it. That's why when you see an egg in a cell, it's dry, it's very tiny, hard to see, and uh, there's not any liquid around it yet. So the bees start feeding it the moment it hatches from its egg, because then they know what to feed, how long to feed, how many cycles to feed. And uh, so royal jelly, for example, would be fed, flooded over uh, a queen that was going to be a queen uh, throughout its development until it caps over. So anyway, now we come to the queen cup or a queen cell. And the queen, when she lays an egg in a queen cup, for example, to make her own replacement, she does that. Uh, when she does that, again, the workers identify that and they continue to build out that cell as a queen cell, which means it has to accommodate the copious amounts of food and resources that they're going to put in there. In fact, they feed so frequently and heavily when it's a queen that uh, you'll see one nurse bee back out from feeding and provisioning that cell, that larva. Uh, as soon as she backs out, another nurse bee comes right up and goes right back in and she's continuing her feeding and cleaning processes. So it's a constant thing. Now here's the other part of that. Um, you also wanted to know if you had a laying worker. So for those who don't understand that, uh, if a colony is queenless and there's no queen pheromone keeping them suppressed, in other words, their reproductive organs are suppressed by the presence of a queen mandibular pheromone, this is part of the eusocial order of uh, the honeybees, right? So they make their own ovaries passive and suppressed and non-productive in the presence of a queen. 
So now in the absence of a queen, it goes the other way, and it takes about 21 days for them to activate their ovaries once they have no queen pheromone present. So they don't have as many ovaries as the queens do, but they have enough and they can start to lay eggs. And that's what's referred to as a laying worker. So the worker is a female and she activates her ovaries and she starts to lay eggs. So when that happens, uh, the question was, does it make a difference if they're putting their eggs in the larger drone cells or if they're laying eggs even in the worker cells and do those produce then drones in the worker cells and they do. And this is why it's really funny because we often refer to the cells that are in the worker brood that uh, laying workers put their eggs in and they're very sloppy about it. They stick their eggs off into the sidewalls, sometimes multiples at a time. They're just trying to get their genetics out there. They're in decline and they have no possible means to recover because unless they can make a queen, that particular colony is just going to dwindle. I also highly suspect that a lot of them drift out and join other colonies. I don't even think they wait. Uh, so we get these rapid reductions in numbers when it comes to laying worker colonies. So then the thing is just uh, they're going to continue to feed those and they're what we call bullet cells. So the little worker cells, they're smaller in diameter. And uh, so to accommodate the little drones that are developing in there, you get these really convex cappings on them where when it comes to a drone cell that's designed for drones, you get a slight convex capping, but it's not as pronounced. So the little bullet cells are usually from laying workers or even a queen. You know, it's rare, but a queen could lay a worker, I mean a drone egg in a worker cell, although that's not common. But uh, if you see that, it's also kind of an indicator that, whoa, we might have laying workers in here because there's drones coming out of the worker cells and uh, you see nothing but those little bullet cells where before it would have been kind of uh, slightly convex when they're just producing workers. And that's also, you can see some undersized drones. Not all drones are the same size. So when they come out of their big fat drone cells laid by a queen, uh, then they're nice and big and woolly little drones. And when they're laid by laying workers, you often get these little malnourished skinny, small drones with even fewer lenses on their eyes. So it's pretty interesting stuff, what goes on there. So they know it because of the pheromones. The other part is uh, moving eggs. There are people, this is a, it's a point of contention among beekeepers, shocking but true. There are some people that say that they have found eggs above queen excluders. Therefore, they speculate that uh, the workers must have collected eggs down below and moved them up there and put them in cells. Now here's the thing, with all the observation that's been done, all the watching that we've done, all of the video, all of the observation hives and everything else, you might come across a worker policing up a cell and consuming an egg. I've seen workers consume eggs right out of the queen. So in other words, she's going across the surface, an egg comes out of her abdomen, and boom, a worker ate it right there. I've not seen a worker carefully pick up an egg with her mandibles, take it and park it somewhere else. So the speculation is based on, whoa, how did that egg get over there? Rather than, I see worker bees walking around with eggs in their mandibles. What are they doing with them? So until we actually see the egg being carried by the bee and put in a cell, we have to say, you know, that's highly, highly unlikely that a worker bee can pick up an egg and take it and put it, or would, put it in another cell and then of course wait for it to hatch and then feed it up to whatever kind of adult it's going to be. So it's because of the magic of the, uh, queen excluders uh, and eggs showing up above it that uh, people think that they must be moving the eggs. But I'm from Missouri originally, which is the show me state. You're going to have to show me that they do that. Now, what would it change if that happened? What would it change if we knew that? Uh, well, for one, queen excluders would mean precious little if the worker bees and the nurse bees could just take eggs and park them anywhere they wanted 
you would end up with eggs and larvae up in your honey super. So I think you would see a lot more of it if that were something that they were doing. So very interesting stuff. Moving on to question number seven, which comes from David in Baldwin, Missouri. I know exactly where that is. Anyway, I came out of winter with two strong hives. This season I have two parent hives and two splits. All are strong. Two questions. One, I built my own bottom boards screened with a metal tray. I initially made entrances three eighths of an inch high. My OA wand, OA is oxalic acid. My OA wand wouldn't fit inside, so I crudely overcut wider entrance five eighths, greater than five eighths high, so my wand would fit. I was not thinking about robbing or rodents at the time. They had made it through last winter strong. Based on your videos, I am considering making new bottom boards and buying a slimmer wand. When is the best time to replace the bottom board? Early winter, mid winter, spring, summer? Two years ago, I took a break from beekeeping. So that's question number two. So we'll stop with this part. You can swap out your gear. I have equipment that needs to be swapped out right now. I made a huge mistake and bought plywood bottom boards, laminate material bottom boards. Even though they were treated, they don't hold up. I'm not going to say where I got them, but I'm not buying laminated bottom boards again. They just don't take it. So um, when's a good time to swap them out? If you're going to do a big inspection or you're going to do what we call a hive evaluation, an inspection means you go in there, you want to know if the queen's laying there, you find eggs, you're out of there. You want to know if they need a super, you check that out, you close it up, you're out of there. You super it, you don't. You do whatever you need to do and you're out. If you do an evaluation, that's every frame of the hive. All the way down to the bottom board, which normally happens in spring when we're cleaning bottom boards. You're scraping out dead bees, whatever, uh, just to help your colony get started. That would be an ideal time to swap out or reconfigure your bottom boards. Now this time of year, right now, we've got honey supers. So if honey supers are on, things get heavy, that means a lot more work for you if you're gonna get down there and change your equipment. But if you've got something else to do anyway, there's never a bad time to do it. It's just, we don't wanna get in there when they're in any kind of stress or they're in any kind of critical time, but it's easier on you if you do it before they do a big nectar flow. So, but you can swap up on a board anytime, especially if it's bad condition. But the good news is robbing we're talking about the entrance reducer and stuff. Robbing is not that big a deal generally until the end of the year or if you hit a big dearth period. But uh, for here, September, end of September, that's prime robbing time. So that's not when you want to be pulling apart all your hives and things like that and exposing them to uh, foraging bees that aren't finding forage. They're the ones that show up when you pull a frame out and it's got honey dripping from it and they get to that and they go back and they tell their friends and now you're dealing with Hundreds of hives, often beekeepers have had to close up their hives when they're trying to do an inspection just because it kicks off a frenzy. So, uh, but as far as swapping that out, you can do that anytime. But I have a recommendation, by the way. We know that uh, the mice can't get out from three eighths of an inch. And I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about what I'm doing because last year, I start off with, uh, depending on the size of the colony, but it might be a three inch, three inch long entrance that's three eighths high. And then some of these mice, depending on where your hives are, you may not be there to see the mouse that shows up. In this case, we have deer mice where I live. And a deer mouse is pretty tenacious and they will sit up there and they'll chew and chew and chew. And I have lots of entrance reducers that I didn't bring for today's presentation, but I have them all hooked together and they show all the different entrances and how the bees were using them, but it also shows the mice that eventually chewed them open so they could get in. So, these are, this is aluminum round stock and uh, you get these from your local hardware store. You can get them on Amazon, you can get them at Home Depot, Lowe's, wherever you shop. Guess what the diameter of this is? Three eighths of an inch. So here's what I'm doing. The interesting part is this is an entrance reducer and this is the entrance we're talking about. And by the way, this entrance just happens to be three eighths of an inch high. So if I take this as a feeler gauge, see that it fills it perfectly. It is exactly three eighths of an inch. So a mouse can't get through it. 
Buttermouse could chew it. I didn't realize that was going to rhyme, so I'm a poet, apparently. Here's what I'm doing. This is overkill. You don't have to do it. This is what I'm doing. If you want to mess with mice and ruin their day in the wintertime, this is how you do it. This is copper plate. This is really heavy copper plate, by the way. Look how stout that is. Anyway, so what I do is, not with this one because it's the right size, but let's say we didn't want mice to be able to chew it. I stick my dowel rod through there and I put my copper plate over it. And what if I had two aluminum dowel rods? Now I put them here and now I can rest my copper plate on that. That way I know I have exactly three eighths of an inch. Easy to remember because it's also B space. And then you just screw this to the front of your hive. In fact, you could cut this one in half. This is the way it came. I bought it on Amazon. It's the way it came. Uh, I could cut this in half and uh, get a couple of them out of it. But then all I do is I create an upper limit because we know they're not going to chew through the bottom board to get in. They chew the entrance reducer or the front of the hive. Let me tell you, they won't be chewing this copper plate because it makes their fillings electrocute them. Okay, not true. Bees don't have fillings, but they have open rooted teeth, which is why they have to chew all the time. And they do not like to chew conductive material. They'll chew the insulation off electrical wiring, but they won't chew the copper wiring itself because it makes their little teeth uncomfortable. So that's why copper. But what if you didn't want to go copper? Oh, look, we had another style of entrance plate. And this happens to come from Kyle at uh, Hivegate. And this is so for those blue hive gates, which are already three eighths of an inch, but you could also take plates like this. This is galvanized steel. And guess what the height of this is? Let me get my gauge out. Oh, it happens to also be three eighths of an inch. So even the hive gate entrances without the blue hive gate in it is a mouse guard. So it's a good idea. It shows you a template. You know, you'd have that screw thing there. There's no reason to change it out during the year, but some people say, for example, see how thin that is? No insulation in the wintertime or whatever. That's why you get your wooden entrance reducer up there and then you put your copper plate on the front of it. Now you still have the insulation value of the thickness of that wood, which is three quarters of an inch, which is less than R1. Here's another one provided by, who else? The Flow Hive people. But it's too tall, but you can't get your oxalic acid vaporizer in there. And that's why I bring this up. Instead of reconfiguring everything, the whole bottom board, just get your entrance reducer, cut it out so it's high enough for your oxalic acid vaporization pan to fit through there. And then come in and plate the front with copper. Your bees will be very happy to know that you cared enough to put real copper on the front because it gets a patina over the years. It looks cool. Your fellow beekeepers will look at your hives and wonder what you're up to and you won't tell them. They'll just know that it looks cool. If it would start raining right now, I would be very happy because I have thousands of seeds out there. Germination is poor. Moving on. Let's say question two. Two years ago, I took a break from beekeeping when both hives didn't make it through winter. I had stored some frames with foundationless comb. The comb are dried and flaky, some whole, some broken up. The frames are moldy and bleached from weather exposure. I was told that my bees would clean up the mold and reuse the comb. I added the entire super three weeks ago to one of my parent hives and they have done almost nothing with it, especially to the frames with broken comb. As a control to my other parent hive, I added an entire super with wax dipped plastic foundation on all the frames and they haven't done much with that either. Just started to build a thin layer of comb across some of the frames. With the flow coming this week in my area, would you recommend giving up on the old comb and replacing it with plastic foundation? No. Okay. So here's what I recommend and uh, it works really well. So you've got that old brittle comb. We all know what that's like. If you've been keeping bees for any amount of time, you come across those frames and there's comb in it and it's thin, it's brittle. You grab it and it gives a little crunch there. 
So the first thing you want to do, of course, is uh, spritz it down with 10%, 10% bleach solution. So 10% bleach, bleach with no softeners, no fabric, not the concentrated stuff, regular bleach, 10% to water. Spray down the whole thing and let it dry right on it. So that's one part. The next part is before you put that in your hive, I would spritz those cells with sugar syrup. So one to one sugar syrup. So four pounds sugar, four pounds water, mix it together, and you've got a light sugar syrup. You spritz that into the cells, the bees will work it, it'll smell like the bees. And then if it's a time of year when they're thinking about producing stuff like this colony right here, these overachievers, all capped honey on the top, mostly capped honey on this level. Now we're down here to brood and now nothing but brood. So brood and honey on this level, nothing but brood down here. They've got lots of resources coming in. How they're doing it, I don't know. And that's because, and this colony is not fed. So what you can do is it sounds like the environment's not providing what they need to build new wax. So they need a lot of things going on for that to happen. One, they need a laying queen. So things need to be right as far as the queen goes. And you need plenty of brood production and things like that for your bees to invest in infrastructure. If your queen's on her way out, they stop building infrastructure. If your queen is newly mated and now she's going to start laying, you'll see an increase in infrastructure if there's a lot of resources coming in. So you can satisfy one side of that by putting in the sugar syrup and putting a feeder on that hive if you're hoping to get them to expand. If you plan to take the honey off later, you cannot feed or should not feed the sugar syrup at all because it's going to get in your honey and your honey's not then from flowers, which is what we want it to be. Um, but spritzing it with sugar syrup, that's gonna get them going. They won't store it, they'll consume it, and they'll start to freshen up the wax. And once they start, you're gonna see white beeswax edges on it, and they're gonna reinforce everything that's broken, and uh, everything's gonna be perfect. The other part of that is they need nice hot days to do it. So if your temps are like ours right now, 58 degrees, they stop building comb. When it gets up into the 70s and the low 80s, they start building comb again. So temperature plays, all of these things have to be considered, but I would not throw away, if it's in frames and it's already in good shape, other than the fact that it's a little brittle, I would let the bees use it. Especially since you did a control, which was a smart thing to do. Uh, you put in heavy waxed uh, foundation, and they also did not build that out. So that tells you that conditions just aren't right for wax building. It's not necessarily the fact that you have this old comb, but I would definitely kill the mold 10% bleach solution. Um, that dissipates very fast and when it dries, even though it smells a little bit like one of those swimming pool towels, uh, the bees don't care. They'll still use it. So that's it for David. Now we have Kyle. So I bought a bee weaver queen, which by the way, bee weaver queens were sold out this spring. Very annoying. She went in and then disappeared. I saw no eggs for weeks. I thought she was either killed or left. I introduced another queen a week later and they killed that queen. A week later, I went in before putting another queen in to see if the workers were laying and noticed eggs. So I looked around the hive and found the queen. Is it normal for a mated queen not to lay eggs for weeks? Or do you think they gave me a virgin queen? Okay, so here's the thing. This is going to tie in with actually the wax production too. If you get a queen bee that's mated in the male and you put her in your hive and she doesn't lay straight away. The same things that I just described for wax production apply to your queen laying. In other words, is there enough protein stored in the hive? That's part of it. But the triggers for the nutrition that the nurse bees carry where they can support brood production there has to be renewed or refreshed protein coming into the hive. So maybe you've put those brand new fancy Hive Alive um, pollen patties on your hive. Those are proven to kick off brood production because they have real pollen in them. If you've got a pollen source outside, there's good forage and they're bringing in lots of pollen, more than 10 a minute, by the way, during high production hours. Uh, if they're doing that and there's nectar available, so if you look in the hive and there, there are cells that are capped with honey, 
but there are also plenty of cells with shiny nectar in them, then it looks like they're well provisioned. On the flip side of that, if you look at the cells and you only have capped honey and you don't have uh, nectar that's filling the other cells, then they may not be provisioned enough to feel that they can support the production of new brood. So the fact that the queen didn't lay right away, and these are just possibilities. I'm not saying that they did not give you a unmated queen somehow. Um, but I'm saying that we have to consider the full picture, which is, are they in a time of year? Do they have the environment necessary to support brood production? And a good indicator of that would be other hives and what they're doing at the time as well. But when you do your inspections, look to see if they're really putting away resources. Is there evidence that they're building new comb, that they're restoring things? Uh, do they have the resources that they need to maintain infrastructure and develop new brood? So that's all critical. The good news is you have Lane Queen now, but uh, taking a couple of weeks to do that, this year, I wouldn't be surprised, but uh, where I am right now, we have a lot of resources coming in, even without rain, which is just very surprising to me. I'm having troubles keeping up with supering my hives. Uh, they're just, they're too productive. So when it comes to uh, where you are, and for those that are wondering, is am I in a dearth? Is my area prone to a dearth? Is there a predictable lack of resources at different times of the year? I'm going to send you to beescape.org, B-E-E-S-C-A-P-E.org. Put in your location information and find out, is this normal for you to have a dearth in June, for example? And you might find that there just weren't the resources necessary for your nurse bees to support the queen laying eggs and developing brood. Because keep in mind too, they control the queen's diet. So if the nurse bees aren't well provisioned, they're not going to feed the queen well. They'll feed her but she'll get a subsistence food. And it's not enough to really kick off meaningful brood production. So what the queen is consuming is going to inspire her to produce eggs or cut back on egg production. So there's a lot more at play there. It'll be interesting to see what's going on. So that's it. That's the last question for today and we're into the fluff part. So I want to thank you guys for watching, but I have something to talk about. My shout out. I haven't been doing shout outs. I've been forgetting overall, but the cover photo for today was this book because guess what just happened? Yesterday was the last day of school around here, which means all the grand monkeys are turned loose and they're stuck in their houses. And where do they take them out to the country so they can run around in my yard? So what if it rains? What if we stuck with them inside? books. So I like books about bees. I actually bought this book uh, months ago and just haven't mentioned it yet. The author is uh, Lance Douglas and the title of the book is Five Busy Honeybees. Now often when we look at children's books, uh, by the way there's psychology involved when it comes to little kids. They like bigger format books. They don't want to see a little tiny book. They like uh, big pictures, big illustrations in there. And the illustration work in this book is pretty good too. So I really like that. Um, the other thing is this book tracks five busy bees. Each of these bees has a specific job. So it might be a guard bee, a water bee, a forager for nectar. It might be feeding the nurse and so on, maintaining the queen. So this isn't overwhelmingly informative for little kids so that they get uh, bored and go looking for their little electronic games that they play with all the time, which magically, when they come to my house, they don't work. I don't know what's going on. You know what this seven-year-old did to me? He came right through the door and goes, Grandfather, what's the, uh, what's the code for your Wi-Fi? And so, oh my gosh, I, I'm not sure that we even have Wi-Fi. So he couldn't log in. But the idea that he would even come and ask me that, are you kidding right now? With all of the place known as outside available, that's where you're going to be with the tie-in. Where are you going to be? You can be with a book. So the other thing is you can make this fun. Uh, one of the things I like to do is uh, quiz the kids. The seven-year-old reads, the three-year-old doesn't. The three-year-old has short attention span theater going on. Buddy likes to look at pictures. And they like to be read too. And guess what? You have to learn to make bee voices. 
So I recommend that, uh, I'm not telling you what to do, but if you want to entertain kids, you know what they like, accents. So if you could give each of these bees, the little nurse bee can have her own accent, and the little guard bee can have her accent, and so on, the water bee can have her accent. She can talk like uh, Water Boy, Happy Gilmore, whatever. Anyway, this is a good book. One of the reasons I like it too is the information that's put in here, the little added information, the facts about beekeeping are accurate. It's clear to me that uh, Lance Douglas is a beekeeper, that he understands bees. The illustrations are good, and uh, I think most children's books are about 32 pages. And uh, there's lots of cool stuff here. Plus, after they've done that, you can take them outside and grill your kids. What's that bee doing? Why is that bee at the pond? Oh, it's a water bee. Well, what do they need the water for? It's in this book. Here's the other thing that I thought was pretty funny. The book, uh, you can also buy things that go with it. So they have these fuzzy bees. And they have clips on them so you can hang them on different things. And that's another thing. Kids are tactile. They like to play games. They want to touch stuff. So giving them little fuzzy bees to play with. I thought that was pretty cool. And if they need a pink one, they have pink ones. They have these. This is my shout out for today. I get nothing from telling you that. I bought this book with my own money. and uh, But that's a good children's book. And I recommend you collect children's books about bees if you want to start to plant those little seeds to the kids so that as they get older. And it is fun to ask your kids questions about bees and they have the right answers. It's kind of surprising in a pleasant way. Get them away from those little screens that they carry around all the time. Okay, so moving on with the fluff section. So that's my shout out. Five busy bees, and they spell that busy bees, B-I-Z-Z-Y, honey bees. And uh, let's see, if you've got a question right now, you happen to be watching this, and you need to talk to somebody. I need to know somebody's opinion right now. Well, I'm just one guy, and a pint can't hold a quart, as they say. So if you are not a Facebook hater, there are groups on Facebook, and one in particular, it's called the Way to Be Fellowship of Backyard Beekeeping. If you go there, you just Google The Way to Be, B-E-E, -E, Fellowship, Facebook, it'll take you right there. And you just click a thing and say, join the group. And there you can have discussions with people all over the world about backyard beekeeping. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. I recommend you go there if you, and you can get answers. You can exchange ideas and Politeness is guaranteed. We allow no bullies. Every question is okay. So the other thing is uh, your plan of the week here coming up. Check for queenless colonies. So we have to look at landing boards. A lot of people have hive swarms and stuff this time of year. Uh, that means that we had queens in the colonies that the swarms flew out of that now need to be mated. Uh, so we should see a steady flow of nectar and uh, of course, pollen coming in. You can't really see the nectar other than you look at the abdomen of the worker bees. You can see how heavy they're coming in, that they're loaded up. But when we see pollen, more than 10 a minute, uh, then we know that they're provisioning for really decent brood. When you see colonies that are not very productive, that are not bringing in a lot of pollen, when it's available, uh, that's a colony you might want to take a look at. So the number two activity that I'd like you to look for is it's time for mite counts. So when you're getting into your hives for whatever reason, uh, for those of you who are doing drone counts, drone cells are capped. And at once they're capped, they go in cages. If you can use the cage method. If not, if you're just doing integrated pest management, then, uh, and you've got drone frames in there, or you just happen across a frame that's 99% drone cells and they're all capped, pull it out. You have a great opportunity to wipe out Varroa destructor mites at a significant level this time of year. And the key to Varroa destructor mites is to stay on top of them through the year. Not try to do these cycles so much, but right now uh, we're ending up with like the dandelions and the apples and pears and trees and stuff like that. So we're going into another cycle now. So we're dealing with white clover, which is bringing in a pretty strong nectar flow too. But this is a great time to know what your Varroa destructor mite loads are going to be. So, And you have lots of different options for how you count those. Learn, I would recommend that you learn to do the sugar shake method. Because if you do that right, 
you're going to find that your counts are actually very accurate and you're not killing all of your bees. And heaven forbid, you should be one of those people that makes a mistake and puts your queen in and does a sugar shake and instead did an alcohol wash or something and killed your queen. And I get that story more often. I'm actually surprised that people admit that they've killed their queens like that. But uh, be very careful about your lethal methods of counting mites. I mean, a queen is also not going to appreciate being shaken around in a bunch of powdered sugar, but at least she'll be alive. So be very careful. Know your varroa mites. Uh, if you've got screen bottom boards and enclosed and you've got sticky boards underneath of those, check them frequently. Uh, each of the observation hives in this building, there are three of them. They all have bottom boards. I haven't found a single mite on any of their bottom boards yet, but I check them frequently. So always look if you've got some way to pull a tray or something from under your hive. Next is uh, look for your struggling colonies. If you're going to keep them going, you either have to feed them or as we mentioned today in one of the questions, combine the colony with a stronger colony. So same can go with a colony that you find is queenless. You can take your queenless colony and combine it with a queen right colony using that newsprint method that I described earlier. So it's a good way to, to get your numbers down. I have to get my numbers down. I know I have one suspect colony right now out of 30 and uh, their activity, the landing board activity is just reduced. So I know they're losing hope. There's likely no queen in there. And so my options are this. If I look into the hive and there's a large population of bees still in it, just no evidence of a queen, no brood, nothing, uh, then I can actually take a frame from one of my nucleus resource hives, pull a frame of brood with eggs and some nurse bees, plunk those in there and trade out the comb. So in other words, I'll pull out a frame from the hive that's queenless, I'll put it in my nucleus hive and I'll pull a frame of their brood and I'll put that into the queenless colony so they can now make a queen because when is that queen going to be viable? Let's say they go straight to work, they take that worker cell with an egg in it, they draw it out, they make that emergency queen cell, right? When are we going to see production from them? We're coming up on July, it's gonna be the end of July. So this is a time of year when you can still do it, it's not too late, and so, but you need to be aware and you need to take action. Now the frame that you pulled out from the colony that's queenless that you put into the nuke that you're pulling your frame of brood with eggs out of, where are you gonna put that? Right in the middle of their brood pattern? No, push all the frames together and put that as your outside frame. So it's a five frame nuke, it would be in the number one or number five position. So there you go, and you're back in business. And those bees in the nukes, they just expect to be exploited. They don't care. Okay, so uh, good time to cycle back. Oh yeah, if you've got stored honey, if you've got capped honey and things like that that you pulled in the springtime and you put it in storage, uh, as we get into the dearth period coming up, mid-July, for example, it would be a good time to put that stuff out and uh, cycle it back to your bees at a time when they're having a hard time finding forage. Uh, the other thing is uh, strong colonies right now are building up with uh, cap wax this observation hive, if this were a standard Langstroth 10 frame box outside in the bee yard, and I had all this capped honey up here, uh, you have two choices. You have probably a lot of choices, but these are two that I recommend. Number one is you add another super on, a medium super, and uh, you have to pay attention to the comb that's up there. If everything is capped, if you've got a 10 frame medium super on that box and it's capped wall to wall, and they've already used burr comb and really attached it well to your inner cover, then uh, they're already full and they may not go above that to produce more comb and then of course store more resources. So what you can do then is put another medium super on, but now we need to do some frame swapping. So it's called checkerboarding. You'll pull every other frame of capped um, honey, right? And you'll actually draw them up to the upper box and you'll take those frames that are not yet drawn out or not full of honey if it's drawn comb and you put those down every other frame. So now we created more space and they've got honey up above which draws the workers up there too and we've got space for them to fill on that medium super. This can help relieve some congestion and keep them producing comb and storing nectar and honey. So checkerboarding, that's the other thing. 
And uh, that's it. By the way, if you're going to provide an upper entrance or upper venting, you should be putting in a queen excluder. I don't personally use queen excluders because the organization is just like you see right here with a single entrance at the bottom. They end up with honey at the top, brood, and then nothing but brood at the bottom and sometimes drones at the bottom. So without a queen excluder, you can do that. But if you install a vent or an upper entrance, that now encourages them to have brood up above where the venting, where that new entrance is. It's not something the bees would choose on their own, but if you insist on putting it there because you've decided that you need to vent through the top of your hive in summer, or you want your foraging bees to have access from up above, you have to have a queen excluder or you will end up then with a mix of brood and resources higher up instead of concentrated around the lower parts of your hive where your entrance is located. So that's it for today. And I want to thank you for being with me and uh, hope you learned something, maybe one or two new things. And if you have any questions or comments, please put them down below. If you want to know how to submit your own question, please go to thewaytobe.org and click on the page marked the way to be. Thanks for spending time with me here today. Have a fantastic weekend. Mm -hmm.